We get them every single night. Lots of emails and comments, suggestions for places around the metro area that could be used as homeless shelters. We hear you, and so does some of Portland City Council. Tonight, we're taking a look at some of those suggestions and how you can help the city decide where its safe rest villages might end up. Maggie, a lot of people have their thoughts on where these villages should go. So many thoughts. And it's time for another Rico Roundup. Because sometimes it seems like the outrage on the internet is a little louder than what's actually happening at the ballot box. But it's not stopping people from trying to get elected leaders out of office. Here's the story. I checked that list of the, the best 500 songs ever made, the one Lester was just talking about at the end of the nightly news there. I couldn't believe it, but our theme music wasn't on it. I know how much all of you love our theme music, but alas, no recognition from Time Magazine. Thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, this is the story. I am Dan Haggerty. This is the show that wants to hear from you, so please utilize all the ways that you can do that. You can email us at the story at kgw.com. You can find me on Facebook or Instagram, or you can use Twitter and that hashtag, hey Dan. Now, you know, we talk about controversial stuff on this show all the time, and sometimes I do a little commentary too, and that, that can be dangerous. You know, people nowadays are just waiting there, waiting for you to slip up so they can hit share and explain why you should be fired and ruined and all that stuff. Our regular viewers know that I, I walk that tightrope pretty often. So whenever I take an unannounced day off, like I did on Tuesday, people always think that I've been canned. When I came back on the air yesterday, Dick wrote, hey Dan, nice to see you back on the air. I was fearing you got recalled. I was off because I'm a dad and I was off doing dad stuff, but I understand why you might think that because Oregon really, really, really likes recalls. Some could say that we love them. And from that love, we created a new segment called Recall Roundup. Yeah! Oregon voters have tried to recall at least 14 people since the start of the pandemic. Is that a lot? Well, I don't know, it feels like a lot. Then again, Oregon tried to recall at least 20 people in 2016 alone, and that was well before the country was completely insane, but we don't have time to talk about that, so let's just deal with the now. Here's the list from 2021 alone. And I'll be honest, I had to Google a few of these. For instance, who is Tammy Stemple, the second name down on the list? Well, it turns out she's the mayor of Gladstone, a town of about 12,000 people in Clackamas County. She's accused of corruption, which is ironic since she was elected in 2017 by running on a campaign to clean up this town after Gladstone recalled two city council people accused of, you guessed it, corruption. It's like a mini Chicago down there. You should recognize, though, the names, the other ones that we have on the list here. People, for instance, are still trying to recall Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler, even though he just won re-election, which I think serves as a pretty accurate bit of polling research for anyone wondering if a recall effort is viable. Then there's Fred Gerard and Lynn Finley, two state Republicans who got in trouble with some of their base when they decided to vote on a guns bill. They voted no on the guns bill, but people thought that they actually should have staged a walkout instead. So let's recall Ann Lindsay Bearshower, a Republican commissioner in Yamhill County, after her stances on some of our favorite talking points like masks and lockdowns and guns and vaccines and all that stuff. See, right now, all of those recalls are in the signature phase. And if people can get enough signatures, and each case kind of requires a different amount of signatures, then we can see an actual recall election. This is what just happened in California with Governor Gavin Newsom. People didn't like the way he handled the pandemic. Yes, I know I'm oversimplifying that, but they collected 1.5 million signatures to boot him out of Sacramento. 1.5 million to spur that recall election. And for a while, it looked like like he may actually lose his job. I mean, just ask Twitter or ask the media in general. Newsom got flayed in the media when he pulled the ultimate out of touch rich guy hypocrite move when last November he dined out with 11 friends and lobbyists at one of the country's most expensive restaurants while at the same time pleading with Californians to stay home. It was the worst of bad looks and social media went nuts. But at the end of the day, it didn't really matter. People didn't actually care, or at least the way that social media made us believe that they actually cared. The recall failed miserably, and he kept his job easily, despite the anger that was retweeted on Twitter and the disdain shared on Facebook, proving once again that being ratioed isn't the same as being recalled. 
Take Tootie Smith and Mark Shaw, commissioners in Clackamas County. Both have said controversial things. Shaw posted flat out racist things on Facebook and the internet went nuts about it. We talked about it on this show more times than I can count. Citizens have threatened to organize recalls against both of them and both have really gone nowhere. Or Mayor Wheeler, let's go back to him. He gets skewered every time he says or does anything with a recall effort that is growing every day online but completely stalling in the physical world. At last check, they don't have anywhere close to the number of signatures that they would need for a recall election. So to all these social media activists out there, don't put too much stock in the share button. Twitter outrage is often justified, i.e. Newsom at French Laundry, but it never seems to carry the weight it pretends to scale, kind of a paper tiger made of ones and zeros. So for anyone out there who's passionate about something, look at the facts. It takes more than a tweet. Oh, and don't remember, uh, don't, don't remember, don't forget to use the hashtag, hey Dan. Now, tonight's big story, more on the city's big plan to open six homeless villages throughout Portland by the end of this year. $20 million in federal COVID aid is getting poured into this, and we're supposed to hear specific locations for these villages pretty soon. In fact, the city's housing commissioner said this to our Maggie Vespa yesterday. We're on track to announce uh, two uh, sites at the end of next week and a total of three sites by the end of September. And then I'm really clear that uh, we will also be able to have um, chronically houseless Portlanders moving into the villages by the end of the calendar year. So tonight, the big question, where will these six villages end up? Where will they be? Supposedly, they can go anywhere. They could be anywhere throughout the city. A lot of you wrote in with ideas on where they should be, and our Maggie Vespa did some digging. Maggie, a lot of people have their thoughts on where these villages should go. So many thoughts. The first idea that we heard from viewers has been in the public lexicon for a while at this point. Ron wrote in, confident he knows the city's plan for at least one village. Now City Hall, he wrote, wants to put another homeless camp in the post office parking lot. That would make four homeless camps within three blocks of each other. He added, I live in senior housing at 9th and Lovejoy. We already have issues with spillover as a result of the three camps and shelters already in place. A fourth would make it unbearable. Ron, we appreciate the email and we should reiterate again, the city has not announced to any locations yet, but there has been chatter about that lot in the Pearl. It used to be part of the post office property, but the city reportedly bought it in 2016 for $88 million. It was slated for a massive development project, but according to Willamette Week, that developer pulled out last week, and now the question hangs over the city's head. Do we turn that lot into a homeless village? It sounds like the answer is no. Prosper Portland telling Willamette Week, first, there's contaminated soil on the property. A rep said the site was previously a rail yard, including a manufactured gas plant. Prosper Portland has a consent judgment with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, which prohibits residential use of any type until contamination is fully addressed. And once that's cleaned up, Metro reportedly has plans to build affordable housing on part of that lot. So putting a village there with as many as 50 people, not looking likely. This next idea from John may have hit on something. John wrote, check into Metro and the land they've purchased with taxpayer money for more green space. Why not use some of that temporarily for homeless people? John, thank you for the idea. And for reference, he's talking about parks and green space purchased by Metro with recent voter approved bonds. Until now, the city had been blunt. They were aiming specifically to use city owned land. And a couple months back, they released a list of close to 70 pieces of land they might use. That's up on our website now. But again, they were all city owned. What about Metro or other governing bodies? Commissioner Ryan's office told me, absolutely, we are looking at all public lands subject to zoning stipulations. So that includes Metro, TriMet, ODOT, and so forth. We are also looking at private properties we might lease or purchase. In other words, they've gone well beyond that list of 70 properties. So it's more open space season than ever. Commissioner Ryan's office says they are vetting sites based on criteria like safety, accessibility and zoning, the things you would expect. And he wants your input. In fact, in our sit down yesterday, he added this. Portlanders are really excited about this. They want to engage with us. And so we're asking them to 
uh, write in to Safe for Us Villages at PortlandOregon.gov. Again, that's Safe for Us Villages at PortlandOregon.gov. And we're looking forward to their enthusiasm um, as we have some headwinds always when you make sightings um, where some neighbors would not want those in their backyard. But we're convinced that there's enthusiasm for this and they will rally behind us as we build these villages and um, provide services in a humane way. And once these are announced, it sounds like the city is going to move fast. Staff tell us they'll announce three locations by the end of this month. One they say will be for people living in their RVs and cars. And then, Dan, as for the others, a staffer wrote, we have pods ready to drop in place at some of the sites as soon as the locations are confirmed. So they're ready to go. We know you'll keep an eye on it for us. Maggie, thanks. Sure. Let's keep talking about politics, shall we, for just a moment. You might have seen Oregon Congressman Kurt Schrader making some national headlines this week. He was one of three moderate Democrats who joined with Republicans to block a bill to lower prescription drug costs. It was part of President Biden's infrastructure package. Schrader tweeted that he is, quote, committed to lowering prescription drug costs, but didn't think the bill would be able to pass the Senate. So he's proposed a different drug pricing bill with his name on it that he thinks will be more bipartisan. But that that's not the only piece of this puzzle here. See, after Schrader voted no, some people on Twitter, of all things, did some digging into his campaign finances. According to the website OpenSecrets.org, Schrader has received more than $614,000 in donations from the pharmaceutical industry as a congressman. They gave him $144,000 during the last election cycle, and that was more than any other industry gave him from, uh, for donations that year. To top it off, Schrader inherited a, quote, fortune from his grandfather, who was a top exec at Pfizer, according to the Oregonian. So you can see why some people think these things influenced his vote, possibly. Well, we reached out to Schrader's office to talk about this today. And instead of just sending a statement, which is what we expected, the congressman actually asked us to interview him. He wanted to give us a response to all of this. We started the interview on Zoom. He's in the car, as you can see. We had a bad connection, so I ended up talking to him on the, uh, on the phone, the old-fashioned way. Here's a bit of our conversation about his connections to the pharmaceutical industry. So there are all of these potential red flags for the average viewer of information like this, somebody reading a quick headline or going through a news report. Sure, sure. No, I get that. Uh, uh, but I guess I would say, number one, if uh, uh, the farmer thinks they're buying a vote, uh, they're getting a very bad deal. I mean, this bill that, that Scott and I are offering, not only is it uh, uh, dangerous for a farmer because there's a chance of passing, but it's more complete and then more in-depth. So I, I, I appreciate people's concern. I, I personally am proud of the work my grandfather did in developing mass production for Pfizer. He saved millions of American lives during World War II. Uh, but that no way influences the work I do. Why do you think, if you're so tough on pharmaceutical companies, why do you think they give you so much money? I don't know. I, I get money from a lot of different uh, interests out there. Uh, they don't. They never tell you? Labor union. They don't tell you, here's why we're contributing to you? No, they don't do that. That's a kind of common fallacy, I think, that uh, the average person has that, you know, uh, the reason they give you money is to say you're going to vote for this or vote for that. I've never, ever done that. And I don't know many legislators that do that. Uh, what they do is uh, they just want to have access to at least plead their case. Uh, I think most smart legislators like me will get the pharmaceutical groups in to chat their case. I'll get the patient advocacy groups to come in. I'll get the insurance companies and all the different groups, and then you make your decision. It's not like they actually have uh, much opportunity to control what you vote on at the end of the day. Now, this isn't the first time the trader has voted against something that his fellow Democrats have wanted. He's a more conservative Democrat, you can say, uh, than we're used to seeing here in the state of Oregon. So on that note, I asked him about the ongoing redistricting process. Oregon lawmakers see are redrawing this map right now to add a sixth congressional district. And right now, Schrader's district is more purple than blue, according to the website 538. Democrats only have a slight political advantage based on the makeup of voters. So it makes sense that Schrader is more moderate. But here is a look at the new map that Democrats are proposing. This would make Schrader's district much more blue, with more of the Portland metro area included in his boundaries. I asked the congressman if he's worried about getting primaried by a more progressive challenge if this map passes. Well, I get primary at every cycle, Dan. Uh, and I'd like to think it is because I represent the people in my district and the state of Oregon, frankly, 
which is not a blue, blue state. It's blue on the surface, but as the Oregonian and you guys have pointed out in your newscast, I mean, there's a lot of folks uh, that are Republicans or independents, and I'd like to think I represent this state very well that way. So, sounds like he's not too concerned yet, anyway. By the way, the Oregon legislature is voting on the final version of the new congressional map on Monday, so if they reach an agreement, we'll know where the new districts are by next week. Our hospitals are overwhelmed right now with people battling COVID. They're stretched so thin that people are actually being turned away in some places or having their surgeries rescheduled, but there could be some hope. It does appear that this treatment uh, does what it's supposed to do, which is keep people from getting so sick that they need to go to the emergency room or the hospital. How Oregon hospitals are using monoclonal antibodies when the story continues. Hey, welcome back. As always, I go through your questions and comments during the break, so please keep sending them my way to the story at kgw.com on email. Use that hashtag, HeyDan, on Twitter. Also, I want to remind you, as I do every night, about our Hey Help campaign. This week, we're asking you to please consider donating to With Love. They help support foster families in Oregon by providing them with resources that they so desperately need, things like blankets and books and diapers. If you want to help them out, just open up the camera on your phone, point it at the QR code on your screen. That'll take you to a donation page, or you can use your computer the old-fashioned way kgw.com slash hey help computers are old-fashioned now yes so uh, we get your questions every day about these different medicines and treatments and things like that for treating COVID we spend a lot of time on this show debunking rumors and those so-called miracle drugs that pop up online every now and then but there is a treatment out there right now that is working to help people get treated for, for COVID and for those symptoms. And it's really getting good results. It's keeping a lot of people who have COVID out of the hospital, not filling up those crucial beds. Kristen Severance explains how monoclonal antibodies are being used in Oregon and how the state wants more hospitals to use it as soon as possible. We get a lot of your emails and messages about COVID and different treatments out there like this one from Ann. So she emailed us asking, since you have been reporting the hospitals in Oregon becoming full of COVID patients, what is the status on using monoclonal antibodies? This is a great question and thank you so much for sending it in. So the status is yes, some hospitals are using this treatment. Now it's not preventative. Doctors say you should still get vaccinated, but this is a hopeful treatment if you do become infected. First, you may be wondering what monoclonal antibodies are. For the answer, we turn to Dr. Morgan Hockey, interim head of the Division of Infectious Diseases at OHSU and the vice chair for clinical programs for the Department of Medicine. So your body's immune system makes antibodies in response to an infection and those antibodies help clear the infection. These are antibodies that are made in a lab um, and are given to people. Um, to help their immune system fight the infection. Dr. Hockey said the antibodies work by attaching to the virus and preventing the virus from infecting cells. The treatment has been given emergency use authorization by the FDA. It's not preventative or a substitution for the vaccine. Dr. Hockey said getting antibodies only works if you get COVID or if you're immunocompromised and exposed to COVID. The whole point of the treatment is to keep you out of the hospital. It does appear that this treatment uh, does what it's supposed to do, which is keep people from getting uh, so sick that they need to go to the emergency room or the hospital. OHSU has treated more than 120 COVID patients with monoclonal antibodies. The majority of the treatments were given during the last six weeks during the surge of cases from Delta. Under the FDA emergency use authorization rules, the treatment is reserved for high-risk patients. The treatment is given through an IV administered by a nurse. However, since June, the treatment can be given subcutaneously or as an injection under the skin. That means more hospital systems and clinics may be able to offer the treatment because you don't need a nurse to administer it. Dr. Shimi Sharif is a senior health advisor with the Oregon Health Authority. So what we're hoping is that this type of formulation specifically will actually make it more possible for more types of settings to start ordering and administering products just because it doesn't require nurses who are in shorter and shorter supply, especially as the surge 
uh, moves on. The OHA said at least 30 hospitals in Oregon are giving the antibodies to patients, but again, they want more hospitals to use it. Salem Health was the first hospital in Oregon to offer the treatment in December of 2020 to high-risk patients over 12. They've done more than 400 infusions and found 70% of those patients did not need to go to the hospital, similar to data in clinical trials. Legacy Health just started a pilot program where COVID patients drive up and get the monoclonal antibody treatment as an injection. So we're doing it outside in, with patients in their cars so they can be observed safely and not pose any risk to staff or each other or other people around them because they have known COVID. Kaiser Permanente is offering the monoclonal antibody treatment to high-risk patients like those going through chemotherapy. Providence and Peace Health Southwest both plan to offer the treatment to patients as soon as this week. Other facilities are getting the treatments too. So it is actually very available to order and it actually the federal government is currently sitting on a surplus so there's no limitations on the number of doses that you can order uh, as well as the uh, number of times that you can order as well ongoing. Again, this treatment cannot prevent COVID like the vaccine, but it may prevent a trip to the hospital. Let's get it out there to as many people as we can and just try and uh, help uh, the crush of people that, that we're seeing in the hospital right now. It's not just hospitals doing the treatment. We found this map from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It shows nearly 50 hospitals, clinics, and pharmacies in Oregon have received shipments of the monoclonal antibody treatments. But again, each facility has different rules or criteria for getting it, so you'd have to contact them directly. You can find the map on our website right now. Do you have more questions about this treatment or anything COVID-related? Just let us know. The best way to reach us, just use everyone's favorite hashtag, HeyDan. Hospital staff is stretched thin right now, so anytime they can keep people out of a bed, it helps out. We know that people battling the Delta variant are filling up our hospital beds. Our staff here at KGW has seen that for themselves when we've done stories in the ICU. It is so bad, members of the National Guard have had to come in and help out at this point. Let's bring in Tim Gordon to talk about this. Tim, first of all, uh, can you tell me how many National Guard troops have been sent in to help out and what are they doing around the state? Right, Dan, we know it was about a month ago that Governor Brown uh, deployed 1,500 National Guard members uh, out into the hospitals of Oregon. So 1,500 uh, National Guard soldiers and airmen uh, from Oregon to about 20 hospitals across the state, you know, especially bad, uh, particularly early on in southern and central Oregon. But we've got about 500 National Guard members in the Portland metro area at the hospitals here helping out as well. You know, they're doing everything from uh, testing people's uh, temperatures and symptoms at the door, uh, to uh, running information desks, transporting patients, that kind of thing. Uh, some are even taking vitals if they're medically cleared to do that. They also provide some security support uh, for the security at hospitals. So they're basically just trying to take the pressure off uh, these overworked and overburdened hospital workers across the state of Oregon, Dan. We've heard so much from the hospital workers. We know what they think. But now that you get this kind of fresher perspective from the National Guardsman, you spoke to one about his experience here in Portland. What did he tell you? Right, we got a great perspective today from a, a guy named Sergeant Jason Hester. He's with the 11th Bravo Infantry, Infantry normally, but uh, this is his third day on the job at Providence St. Vincent. So he is uh, working at St. Vincent Hospital here in Portland. Uh, he's working on the information desk uh, in the doctor's wing. So not in the main hospital part, maybe a little bit slower for him where he is, but he says it's slow at times, busy at other times. He does everything uh, from answer questions, obviously, to help people find their way up, transport people up to the rooms. Here's what he had to say about working on the information. A lot of questions like, why are you here? So we explained to him. So the reason why we're here is to help out the hospital staff that's because they're really short staffed, And they're just really appreciative of that. Like, oh, thank you very much. Thank you for your service. And it's, it's really neat. I, it's like I said, it's really fulfilling. It's like totally different from what I've done before. So this really is a different kind of deployment for Sergeant Hester. You know, he's worked uh, deployments in Afghanistan. He's worked wildfires here in Oregon. He just got back from Kosovo, in fact. So this really is different to be working uh, locally, so close to home. He says that really is fulfilling. And another nice part about it, Dan, is that he is able to go home to his family in St. Helens every night. That must be nice. I know a lot of people here are grateful for their help. Thanks, Tim. For sure. Yep, you bet. Okay, keep sending in your questions and comments. I'm checking them on the phone right now. Use that hashtag, hey Dan. We'll talk about a few when we finish the story next. 
can't read any comments tonight. I was just talking to my producer at the break. I said, how much time do we have? She said, none. In fact, we're two minutes in the wrong direction. I should have stopped talking 10 seconds ago. The fact that I'm still talking right now is they're very upset with me. So don't, don't zoom in on me now. Come on. Fine. All right, we'll see you tomorrow.